Lambda Calculus is the smallest Turing-complete programming language created by Alonzo Church in the 1930s. In Lambda Calculus, everything is a function, which are formally known as abstractions. They look like this. Lambda, the syntax keyword for creating a function, the parameter, a period, and then the body, which shows what to do with the parameter. For example, this function takes an input and adds one to it. It makes sense that the name we give to parameter doesn't matter, as long as the same variable is used in the body. In other words, the parameter name is simply a placeholder. These placeholder variables are known as bound to their abstraction and can be swapped out with any other variable name in a process known as alpha conversion, denoted with the identically equal sign. To call this function, we simply follow it by our input. This is formally known as an application. Parentheses, as usual, can be used for clarity or to show the order of applications. Otherwise, applications are bound left to right. We will evaluate this expression by substituting all instances of the bound parameter in the body with our input. This process is known as a beta reduction. However, we must be careful while substituting. Let's take the function lambda x, y. If during beta reduction we need to substitute y for z, this expression simply becomes lambda x, z. However, if we're substituting x for z, it will remain lambda x, y. This is because x is a bound variable or a placeholder function parameter. Let's rename the abstraction with alpha conversion. Now we can see why our substitution doesn't have an effect. Meanwhile, y is unbounded to the abstraction or free in this context. In other words, it actually represents a value. Thus, it is substituted for z. In many cases, we will be passing abstractions as inputs to other abstractions. In order to beta reduce this application, let's first clarify some variables. Notice that the y's in the second expression are bounded and different from the y in the first expression. Alpha conversion can be helpful for clarifying variables in these scenarios. Let's alpha convert the second expression into lambda a a for clarity. Now we can substitute as normal to get our final simplified expression. To create multi-parameter functions, we will use a technique called currying. It involves writing a function that takes an input, which returns another function that takes the next input, and so on. For example, we can write addition like this. It is equivalent to this arrow function sequence in JavaScript. The outer input a is bound all the way down and is substituted into the inner function when the outer function is called. We can do this for any amount of abstractions to get any amount of inputs we want. Now, instead of just passing in two parameters when I call add, we just call the function twice. We can also abbreviate curried functions in lambda calculus by simply writing consecutive parameters. Now that you understand lambda calculus syntax, remember that the only data type is the function. Even the addition and numerals that I used before, for example, don't exist in pure lambda calculus. However, we can encode these data types in functions. Let's start with the boolean. In order to encode them with functions, we must consider what booleans do. If we boil it down, they're purely used in the conditional statement to choose between two possible outcomes, one for true and one for false. We will directly write this in lambda calculus. The true function will take two arguments and choose the first one. The false function will take two arguments and choose the second one. Notice how, in a way, our booleans act as self-contained if statements. It is important to understand that this definition is simply a convention. We can just as well exchange these two definitions given that the rest of the program is written accordingly. It only matters that each boolean takes two arguments and chooses one. Let's define the NOT function. It takes an argument and applies it to false and true respectively. Observe what happens when we apply NOT to true. First, let's replace true with its definition. Now we can substitute it into the not function like normal. Observing what true does, we recall that it returns the first argument it's given, which in this case is false. And that is our final result. Thus, we have just effectively negated true. It is easier from now on to simply think of functions as doing something like picking an argument instead of reasoning through beta reduction every single time. Let's apply not to false now. As false is a function that picks the second argument it's given, we can now easily deduce that this application returns true. Similarly, we can define the AND operator. It has two parameters and applies the first input onto the second input and false respectively. If the first input is false, the statement will short circuit and simply choose the second option, false. If the first argument is true, the output of AND depends on the second input, which is chosen by our true function. Similarly, you can define the OR and XOR operators. Knowing that booleans choose between two values, a pair data type can be easily derived. 
consider the pair function as a way to obtain one of the two values stored instead of just storing them. All it does is take a boolean as input and applies it to two stored values. When the input is true, the first value is chosen. When it is false, the second is chosen. The not and even and or or functions can be interpreted as accessing elements in a pair. Now let's define the non-negative integers with what is known as the church numeral encoding. A number n in this system is written as a function f applied n times to a value x. The actual function and value are passed as arguments to the number function. With this definition, a church numeral, say 3, for example, literally means do something three times. In order to see how this works, let's first define what is known as the successor or plus one function. First, we take our input church numeral and apply it to f and x. After substituting, this removes the function part. Now we simply wrap it in one more instance of f. To put it back into church numeral format, we put the result in lambda f x. Our final function looks like this. Let's define addition. If we want to add 2 and 3, we simply call the successor function 2 times on 3. Remember that the church numeral 2 literally means executing its first argument 2 times on its second argument, so we can just write 2 successor 3, which reduces to successor of successor of 3 or 5. Thus, addition can be simply defined as such. Finally, let's talk about the predecessor function, which subtracts 1 from any church numeral n. Because you cannot directly remove an application of a function, we must use the numeral n to apply a function n minus 1 times. Let's begin by observing a neat mathematical pattern. Start with a pair of numbers 0, 0. Now we will execute a function arbitrarily named phi on this pair that replaces the second number with the first and increments the current first number. When I call phi once, I get 1, 0, then 2, 1, and so on. Notice how for all pairs after 0, 0, the first number in the pair is how many times I've called phi, and the second number in the pair is exactly one less than that. Thus, when I call phi n times, I will get a pair n, n minus 1. Now we just need to extract the second number of the pair to get n minus 1. Using the knowledge of pairs we already have, we will define phi. We take a pair p and return a new pair. In the first element of the new pair, we call successor on the first element of the input pair. For the second element, we simply just take the first element of the input pair. In order to find a predecessor, we take n and call phi n times on the 0, 0 pair. Finally, we extract the second element by applying it all to false. Similarly to addition, we can define subtraction with the predecessor. Remember that church numerals are not defined for negative numbers. When we attempt to call predecessor of 0, we will still get 0. Similarly, if we attempt to subtract the larger number from the smaller number, we will also get 0. To define relational operators, we must first start with a function that checks whether or not a number is 0. This will become useful later on. This function can be defined as such. Notice that the constant false function in the middle always returns false. When any non-zero numeral n is substituted, the false function is applied n times on true, still returning false. However, if and only if zero is substituted, the false function is called zero times on true, so true returns. Now let's define some relational operators. Consider two numbers a and b. When a is equal to b, running predecessor a times on b yields zero. However, when a is greater than b, it will also give 0, as the predecessor of 0 is still 0. Thus, if and only if a is greater than or equal to b is the expression a predecessor b equal to 0. Now we can write the greater than or equal to abstraction with our 0 function. Less than or equal to can be defined just by swapping a and b. The equality function can be achieved by anding these two functions. Similarly, we can define less than, greater than, and inequality. In pure lambda calculus, the names of functions and variables are symbolic. That means a function can't achieve recursion by calling itself, because it has no way to refer to itself. However, we can achieve recursion in a different way. Let's assume there is a function rec for recursion, which is able to take an input function r and applies that function to rec of r. If we continue simplifying, we can see that this causes r to be indefinitely called on itself. This pattern is known as general recursion, and it can be shown that any other form of recursion can be encoded in this way. But on a functional level, consider what is happening. Rec is a higher order function, which takes a function and triggers recursion on it, without r needing to directly refer to itself in its body. 
This is exactly how we will encode recursion without named functions. However, there's still a caveat. It appears rec still needs to be referenced in its own body. However, equivalently, we can allow rec to recreate itself in its own body. In Lambda Calculus, one way we can write rec is known as the Y Combinator. The key to the recreation of the rec function without self-referencing is known as self-application. Notice how the inner function is applied to itself, and in each inner function, x is also applied to itself. Through beta reduction, we can indeed verify that rec r, or in this case, y of r, is equivalent to r of y of r. To explore how we should write our recursive function r, let us again start with writing y r. Remember that as a higher order function, the y combinator takes in our input function and returns a new recursive function. So let us arbitrarily call this new function with a number, like 3. As we have shown, y r simplifies to r of y of r. Now we observe that our input function r is being called on two expressions, y of r, and 3. y of r will be our first argument to r, which we will call parameter f. This is the recursive call which we will use inside r to re-trigger the recursion. 3 is the second argument to r, which we will call parameter n. This is the current input to our recursive function. Let's make this a bit more concrete by declaring a function that takes the sum of the numbers from 1 to n. Recursively, that's equivalent to n plus the sum of the numbers from 1 to n minus 1. We also need to declare a base case. For simplicity, let's set it so that when the input is 0, we just return 0. In r, we need to first check if our current input n is 0 with our z function. If it returns true, we will select the first outcome we give it, 0. Otherwise, we will use successor to sum n with the result of the recursive call to r, argument f, called on the predecessor of n. Now with this definition, r of y of r of 3 is simply equivalent to 3 plus y of r of 2, and we can continue to expand this until we get to the base case. The final expression correctly reduces down to 6. Notice that we were able to bypass the limitations of self-referencing by simply passing the function into itself as an argument with a higher order function, the y combinator. This effectively helps you self-reference and create recursion in Lambda Calculus, as well as any other language which doesn't natively support it. With these data structures and design patterns, you can now nearly define anything in Lambda Calculus. However, if you still want to explore more, there are a few amazing resources linked in the description, and a quick search should yield plenty of results. If you have any questions, put them in the comments, and I'll be glad to answer them. I'll see you guys next time. Peace.